Hi, and welcome to video two of two on chapter 11. Now, um, as I had mentioned last video, um, this chapter is sort of broken up into uh, two related but not quite so related parts. The first part, like I said, was an addendum to, uh, you know, torque and rotational motion. <clears throat> but um, this one's going to introduce something uh, that's, that's sort of a new concept. So uh, what I want to talk about in this lecture is angular momentum. Now, um, angular momentum, much like regular momentum, um, is a defined quantity. And um, uh, depending upon which book you use, uh, generally it's uh, either a cursive L or a capital L vector that's used to denote it. Um, your book uses little l uh, for individual angle, angular momenta and then big L for a total. So we'll stick with that convention. Uh, but it's defined the following way. Um, it is defined as R cross P. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, much like torque, it has a similar form except for this being, um, uh, this is momentum instead of uh, force. <clears throat> so, um, that said, um, I would like to show you that uh, it bears a similar relationship between regular momentum and, uh, you know, the, the, the stuff that we're talking about now, uh, you know, uh, similar to how torque does with respect to force. All right. So, for a moment, um, just imagine taking the derivative of your angular momentum with respect to time. All right. So, uh, you know, uh, cross products work just like uh, the product rule does uh, whenever you're taking derivatives of them. You have to maintain the order because, uh, you know, things in cross products don't commute. Uh, what I mean is, is if you remember, uh, you know, A cross B, it's not the same thing as um, B cross A. Uh, they're they're related by a negative sign, so um, so here, um, all you have to do is to preserve the order of the derivative. So we'll do the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second with respect to time. Now, um, just to point out. Um, Velocity, we know by definition, is dr dt. So that's what this is. This is v. Okay. Just like we know that another way of writing, and probably a more correct way of writing Newton's second law with respect to force, is how the momentum uh, changes with respect to time. So this is f. All right. So um, let's just sort of uh, expand this out here. Uh, this is V cross. Now, momentum is M times V plus um, R cross F. Now, look, um, the M here, for all intents and purposes, is just a scalar. Okay. So you could pull that out of here in this term, and that would be M times V cross V. Uh, so any vector crossed into itself is zero. That's a, one of the properties of the cross product. You, you can prove it yourself if you'd like. <clears throat> so, so what that means is, is this term right here doesn't count. And when you take the derivative of your angular momentum with respect to time, um, it's R cross F, which we know to be torque. So, so look. The angular analog of force, which is torque, is also the same thing as the derivative of your angular momentum with respect to time, which looks identical to F being dp dt. So once again, um, things bear out, okay? They, it, it, all, all it is is a change of variable with the, the added caveat that, that L does not look like P, it's R cross P, just like 
torque does not look like force. It's R cross F. Uh, now, with respect to angular momentum, anything can have angular momentum as long as it's moving with respect to some point in space and uh, that movement looks like a rotation. So, for example, you could literally be standing here on the ground watching something move through the air and talk about its angular momentum with respect to your, yourself. All it has to do is to be some distance of R away and be moving with a momentum of P. Okay. Now, again, this works the same way. If you carry it out, this is your angle here, theta. And, you know, uh, as a consequence, because this is a cross product, you can talk about the magnitude as being R times P times sine of theta, and then just use the right-hand rule to determine, you know, the direction. For example, in this particular case, if you put your fingers in the direction of R and you close them towards P, you get into the board like that which is, uh, you know, clockwise rotation, which is pretty obvious from what we see right here. So that said, let's just do a few simple examples dealing with uh, angular momentum. And in this one, we have a person who looks directly overhead and he sees an airplane that has a mass of 4,500 kilograms fly by at 75 meters per second. Um, I know that the plane is 750 meters above the ground. And what I'd like to know is, is what is the angular momentum relative to the person? So um, here's the ground. Okay. <clears throat> Let me um, so we'll draw us a person here. Now directly overhead, um, the person has their plane that they see. Uh, here's a plane. Okay. And, and relative to where the person is, it's, uh, it's directly overhead by 750 meters. Now it's, it's also flying... Um, above the ground, we're going to assume that that means that it's flying level two, which would be like this. Okay. So what that does is to make the angle here between the direction of the plane and the, the location of the plane relative to the person who sees it, a right angle. All right. So, so R here, um, if we think of this as being sort of, uh, the Y axis and this right here being the X axis, which yeah, I could do that put that in here. Let's be consistent here. So this is Y and this is X. So, so if you wanted to write this out sort of in vector form, um, you, you would say that R would be, I'll say R Y hat where uh, R is 750 meters and then here we have a V and um, that is V X hat okay so um, so here um, V is 75 meters per second and uh, the mass of the plane is 4,500 kilograms so this is what we're given and what we like to do is to find L. All right. Now, uh, in this particular drawing, um, Z would be in and out of the page. So this axis right here would be the Z axis um, with uh, this being positive. All right. And you can check that if you put your thumb in the direction of Z and you curl your fingers, uh, the curl would be this way, which is counterclockwise, rotating from X to Y. X cross Y is equal to Z. Okay, so <clears throat> that said, um, all we want to do is define the angular momentum. And that's going to be, uh, you know, L is equal to R cross P. Now, um, what I propose we do, just to make this interesting, is to um, do this in full cross product form. just to show you what you get. So here's X hat, here's a Y hat, here's a Z hat. R is the first thing. It only has a Y component. Um, v is in the X hat direction, which means our momentum, which is M times V. It's just gonna be um, M times V, not V vector. And that's gonna be an X.
All right. <clears throat> so you put your fingers, uh, your finger on the direction on X and blot out that row in that column right here. Uh, R times zero, zero, zero times zero, zero. So there is a zero X hat part minus. Put your finger on Y. That's going to block out this column in this row. All right. Zero times zero, zero. MV times zero, zero. All right. And plus, so this is a Y hat. Plus, if I put my finger on Z and I cross that out, I get zero times zero is zero minus MVR. And that's Z hat. So, so here, our momentum L vector is minus M V R Z hat. And if you wanted to, you could take and you could actually put your fingers in the direction of R, close them towards V here. And what you would have is you would have your thumb would be N. And we know N here means clockwise rotation, which would be negative. So look, it bears out. Okay, it works exactly the same way. So, so here, um, you know, uh, our mass is 4,500 kilograms. V um, is 75 meters per second. R is 750 meters. And if I uh, multiply all this together, I get uh, two sig figs, two sig figs, two sig figs, um, 2.5 times 10 to the 3, 6, 7, 8. 10 to the 8th. Now let's look at the units here. So um, <clears throat> if you remember our conversation when we talked about uh, linear momentum, um, the units were kilograms, meters per second, and there wasn't really anything unique about it. Well, with angular momentum, there is something unique. Or something important, rather. And uh, so let's just take a look at the units. The units would be a kilogram times a meter squared per second. Okay. So, so kilogram meter per second squared or newtons okay if i take this and i multiply it by another meters i have a newton times a meter which is a joule so this is almost a joule what i'm missing is a second squared in the bottom so i'm going to multiply this in the by the form of seconds over seconds and what that'll do is to pull we can pull this the seconds here in the bottom up into here and make this right here a joule. This is a joule second. All right. And, and in general, this is the accepted unit, joule seconds of angular momentum. And um, if you were to go further into physics, specifically dealing with things like quantum mechanics, uh, this is this is used all over the place. So there you go. All right. Simple example. All right, so, so in this example, uh, what we're looking at is the behavior of, of something called an addle addle. Now, an addle addle uh, is something that's been used for a very, very long time. Um, I remember reading about these things, and if I remember correctly, they found these things uh, as old as about 3000 uh, BC. Like, this is roughly like how old they found these things to be. Um, at least the ones that they've dug up and and what they do is is they extend the length of the throwing arm we call it the lever so so what that does if you think about our conversation way back when uh with respect to torque and cheater bars is this allows you to generate more force on a spear when you throw it which means you can throw it much further and all that's done like i said just by extending the length of the arm so, um, 
you know, these, these things we found across cultures like in Africa and, and, you know, Central America and just all over the place. So what I'd like to find out here is what the angular momentum upon release of this thing is. And we're going to think of sort of a, a place that sits between this and this, where the, the point of the pivot, which is the shoulder, is maybe sitting something like that. And the actual release at this point causes the spear to go like that. And so if you were to extend the length of R here this way, just so you can get a sense of what the angle looks like. Whoops, that was a mistake. Maybe I can put that back. No, I can't put that back, can I? Maybe I can. Oh, look at that. There it goes. All right. Um, so, so this angle right here is 20 degrees. The length from shoulder to where the momentum is, if you will, we're interested in. This is R, which is one and a half meters. Okay. And when this thing is released here, it's released with a speed of 150 meters per hour, miles per hour, no kilometers per hour, rather. There. So, so let's write down our givens. <clears throat> we have a length of, uh, of release, which is one and a half meters. The mass of this thing is one and a half kilograms. The angle is 20 degrees. Um, the speed is 150 kilometers per hour which um, let's convert that to, uh, to meters per second real quick. Let's see, 150, 41.7-ish. Um, meters per second. And what we like to find here is uh, the angular momentum, okay? Now, um, I'm going to use the right-hand rule on this. So if you put your fingers in the direction of R and you close them towards V here, then you have your thumb into the board, which makes our angular momentum negative. So here, the magnitude of it is just going to be R times P times sine of theta. But the direction, if you think of your standard x, you know, z, or sorry, rather, uh, y and x coordinates, it would be in the negative z hat direction. Okay, if you wanted to use a coordinate system that looked like this. Whoops. Let me just go ahead and put that in here. All right, so so into a z, or a minus z rather. So uh, r is one and a half meters. P is one and a half kilograms times forty one point seven meters per second. Uh, we have a sine of twenty degrees there, and let's just go ahead and do our thing here. Um, I get 32 to the sig figs that we have. So this would be minus 32 joule seconds. All right. So, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now is to step away from just simple angular momentum examples. And I want to talk about what angular momentum is really, really, really important um, with respect to and that's its conservation principle. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do now is to uh, further explore angular momentum a little bit. Uh, remember, uh, we had written uh, it as R cross P. Okay. And we also know the relationship between it and torque. That is, that torque can be written as uh, dl dt in much the same way as force can be written as dp dt. So uh, that said, um, 
what I'd what I'd like to think about uh, for a moment uh, would be uh, the other form of torque, and that is that you can write torque also as I times alpha. Now, I itself is a number. All right. Um, there are situations in which you could potentially have an I that changes somehow uh, in one specific situation. But that's well, well above and beyond the preview of this course. So for all intents and purposes, I is, is, is a constant. So if you think of torque, again, as dl dt, and you look on the right-hand side, alpha we know is d omega dt. And here, I can move the i onto the inside because it's a constant. So dl dt is the same thing as d by dt of i times omega. Or um, an alternate way of writing L is I times omega. Ah, see, it's just like momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity. Here, angular momentum is the angular idea of mass times the angular velocity. So to work an example of it, um, let's take a look at this. Uh, how much torque is required to spin a spherical shell of mass 5 kilograms from rest to 50 revolutions per second in 2 seconds? The radius of the shell is 75 centimeters. So um, one way of approaching this problem would be to use angular momentum and torque. So here's our, our shell right here. We'll say it's going to spin this way. So uh, that would be spinning. Um, well, let's say counterclockwise, but I don't think it really matters in this particular point. So, um, we're given an initial angular velocity of zero, a final angular velocity of 50 revolutions per second. Now, one revolution is two pi radians, so this would be the same thing as basically 100 pi radians per second. Um, we're going to do this in an elapsed time of 2.0 seconds. And the shell has a radius of 75 centimeters or 0 0.75 meters. We also know it has a mass. The mass is 5 kilograms. Now what I'd like to find is the torque. And the way I'd like to approach this is through um, this form right here. Uh, we're say average torque. Assuming the torque is constant, or at least the, uh, the angular acceleration is constant. So L, we know we can think of as R cross P. But we also now know an alternate form of writing in a side times omega. Now, if this thing starts from rest, what that means is, is that my initial angular momentum is, is, is zero. So it's the same sort of idea of buying kinetic energy and things like that. Now, later on, um, I'm spinning at omega, we'll say, which means that my final angular momentum here would be I times omega, whatever that is. Okay. Now, um, here, um, spinning this way, let's see. Why don't I, just to be consistent with things, um, why don't I add a depth to this? Instead of calling this xy, what I'm going to do is to call this, just so we have a clear axis of rotation that sort of matches what we've talked about so far, z y and x coming out like this. Now we have the standard right-handed coordinate system that we're used to. Okay, so so here in this case this would be rotating this way at the end of the day 
would be positive because you're rotating from x towards y. Okay. So our omega in this case uh, would scoot right down the z-axis. If you use the right-hand rule, uh, that's what you get. So that's L at the end of the day. So, so really, uh, all we're missing is the moment of inertia of a, uh, a shell. Um, and let me look that up real quick. Uh, this is a good example of one right here. Yeah, here we go. Uh, let me copy this. And then what I'm going to do is to add this in right here, because we may need it later. Uh, paste it right there. There we go. So so here's what I have. Um, a thin spherical shell uh, about any diameter uh, is uh, two-thirds MR squared is what it looks like. It's a little hard to read. Let me verify that. Yeah, two thirds, two thirds mr squared. So, so my I here is that. All right. Now, so I want to find my torque. My torque here is just going to be my change in angular momentum over time or L minus L naught vector over T, noting the fact that that's zero. So it's just L over T, or I omega Z hat over T, or two thirds M R squared omega Z hat over T. We have all that information here, two thirds, the mass is 5.0 kilograms. R, 0 0.75 meters. You have to square that. Omega, 100 pi radians per second. And the amount of time is 2 seconds. So let me put this in my calculator. See 100 pi. Undivide that by two. 295. Newton meters in the z hat direction. Okay. So, uh, you know, two sig figs here, two sig figs here, two sig figs here, one's there. So this would be about 300. All right. Now, uh, the Z hat means that, um, you know, obviously if we want this thing to, to start from rest and then at the end of the day accelerate this way, we're going to need torque that... Um, that is in this direction. So this is going to be the direction of tau. So if you take and you, you know, uh, do uh, sort of an R cross F on this, you get your thumb pointing up. So it's going to be Z hat. So everything works out. Now, so, so as you can see, um, all this basically is bearing out exactly the same way that, that, you know, uh, linear momentum did, uh, with the added caveat that now it's, uh, it's acting at an angle with respect to a point of rotation. Now what I'd like to do is to take a look at what we're really, really, really interested in angular momentum with respect to, and that's its conservation principle. Now this is a pretty big deal. So I want you to imagine, um, for lack of a better way of describing it, a bunch of particles in a box, we'll say. This is our system. All right, so... Um, 
just like this maybe. Maybe you got some point of rotation on the inside that we're just looking at things with respect to. Draw a box. So maybe here's our point of rotation and you've got all these uh, particles here moving in different directions with respect to the point of rotation. Now, the trick here is that as these things move, they're moving at constant velocities. Okay, so they're not experiencing any sort of torque from the outside, so uh, no net torque. Okay, now I'll call this M1, I'll call this M2, this is M3, this is M4, um, R1, V1, R2, V2, R3, V3, and R4, V4. So, so if you have no net torque here, what that means is, is that if I look at all of the individual torques due to the motions of these things here, I'm going to get zero. So uh, if I add up the torque here, since there's no torque from the outside causing these things to experience any sort of angular acceleration, I have three or uh, four torques, one torque, two torques, three torques, four torques. They're all going to add up to zero. They're all individually zero. But, but remember, torque can be written as the change in angular momentum with respect to time. So another way of thinking about this is that you have uh, DL1, D tau or dt rather, plus dl2, dt plus dl3, dt plus dl4, dt. So um, the thing is though, is that um, the, the derivative is a, a, a linear operator. It distributes throughout all these things. So this is just l1 plus l2, plus L3, plus L4, like that. Now, the derivative of something equal to zero, that means that the thing here is equal to zero or is constant. So um, we know as these things move that their individual angular momenta aren't zero, but they have to be constant in this case when you um, add them all up. Well, that's interesting. So really what this means is, is that the change in my angular momenta here when I add them all up is equal to zero. So change in that, we're going to call the sum right here big L. It's just a vector sum. So the change in L is going to equal to zero which means that if I take the final and I subtract away the initial, I get zero. Ah, well, what do you know? This is conservation of angular momentum. Okay, so this is the reason why if you, uh, you know, sit in a... Uh, a computer chair or something like that or an office chair and you spin with your arms out when you bring your arms in you spin faster because the angular momentum is conserved this is the reason why planets that orbit the sun as they get closer and closer they go faster and faster and faster and they're at the fastest at their closest and at their slowest at their furthest away is conservation of angular momentum this is the reason why an ice skater whenever they spin in place they pull their arms in, they go faster. This is the reason why if you ride a bicycle, you're able to stay upright whenever you ride your bicycle. This is the reason why motorcycles just don't fall over, you know, on the, on the interstate uh, when you're driving. And that's because you have this, this property of, of mass going around a point, okay, 
with a velocity that that overall property is something that 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 nature tries to keep constant okay or conserved now as an example uh, i want you to think of a dollop of clay of mass 0.2 kilograms that's dropped uh, 25 centimeters from the center of a rotating pottery wheel so the wheel is rotating at one revolution per second it has a radius of uh, 30 centimeters and a mass of four and a half kilograms what I want to know is, is, is what its angular, angular velocity going to be once the clay hits and sticks to the well, or wheel rather. So this is, this is an inelastic collision. So if you think, uh, for example, of what we're looking at here, we have this, this pottery wheel, which um, I'll sort of draw this way. Yeah. Draw this pottery wheel here. Which is just a it's a it's a disc, right? So this right here is gonna be the axis of rotation. Which we'll call the z axis right there. So as this thing is rotating, um, we'll have it rotate in this direction so it's positive. All right. So that's Y, and that's X like that. So uh, this thing right here, uh, which I'll call its mass M sub W for wheel, is four and a half kilograms. Um, it has an initial angular velocity of um, one revolution per second or uh, two pi radians per second. Its radius here is 30 centimeters. I guess really that was 0.3. Um, and what we're going to do is we have this dollop of clay right here that I'm going to drop down onto this thing. Now, when the clay hits, since its motion is downwards and it doesn't have any side-to-side -side motion, the initial angular moment or the angular velocity of the clay is going to be zero because it's moving this way and not in a direction of rotation that matters. So when it hits here, it's going to stick and it's going to stick a distance of R sub C away. Now R sub C here is 25 centimeters. And the mass of the clay is uh, 0 0.20 kilograms. So this is basically what we've been given. Now what we're trying to find is what the angular velocity of this thing is going to be at the end of the day. Now, if you remember, during an inelastic collision, what happens is the objects stick together. So not only will be the clay, not only will the clay be moving at omega, but the disc will be moving at omega as well. All right. So now let's look at our our uh, our angular momenta. So my initial angular momentum, which I'm going to call L naught, is going to be the initial angular momentum of the wheel plus the initial angular momentum of the clay. But the clay has an angular velocity of zero. Now after the collision, 
you will have the angular momentum of the wheel and the angular momentum of the clay. But the thing is, is that their angular speeds are going to be the same. Their angular velocities are going to be the same. So that said, if we look over here, we're dealing with a wheel, which is a cylinder, rotating about an axis, solid cylinder or disk. Um, oh, not like this, rather, but like this. <laughs> One half mr squared. So the moment of inertia of the wheel is going to be uh, one half the mass of the wheel times the radius of the wheel squared. Now, when this thing hits, its angular momentum is going to look like r cross p. Or, if you think of its moment of inertia it's a discrete object it falls r sub c away from an axis of rotation so its moment of inertia is just going to be m sub c r sub c squared okay so, initially the wheel is rotating this way, which is positive, or up the z-axis. So what we expect is that my initial angular momentum, which is L wheel naught, is going to be the moment of inertia of the wheel times the angular velocity of the wheel initially, going in that direction. Now, after the collision, our final angular momentum is going to have to be in the z-hat direction. It's conserved. It's a vector. But you're going to have two. You're going to have the wheel plus the clay, whose moment of inertia is this. Now their omegas are the same. Well, help if I put the omega there, right? And the thing is, is these are equal to each other. Uh, we we'll get rid of that, and so far this is looking identical to what we do when we have a standard uh, inelastic collision. It's just that our masses are now moments of inertia. Now remember, uh, the moment of inertia of uh, a wheel is one half uh, m omega or m w rather r w squared. That doesn't change, at least not in this situation. And um, the uh, the one for the clay. So really, you know, what's happened is, is we have more stuff to account for because we have structure. I mean, that just makes sense. So we have a one half times uh, the mass of the wheel is four and a half kilograms. Uh, the radius of the wheel is uh, 0 0.30 meters. The initial angular velocity of the wheel is 2 pi radians per second. Then after the collision, information, same thing here.
put that in. And let's just do some math. So I have that divided by this. Plus that on the bottom. Um, five point nine one nine two ratings per second. So, um, compare that to what it originally was, which would have been, um, you know, six point two eight. So, your initial angular velocity would be uh, what was 6.28 if you actually take and multiply two times pi. So as you can see, the whole thing ends up being going slower. All right. Obviously, if you round, this rounds to six and this rounds to six, but you can see the difference. All right. Now let's do another example. Um, you have a satellite that's rotating, and what it's going to do is to eject a golf ball sized chunk of steel that has a mass of 25 kilograms. The satellite itself has a mass of 500 kilograms before it ejects the material and it's rotating 10 times a second. What would the new rotational speed of the satellite be after the chunk is ejected? Now what we're missing here is since it's spherical is, is a radius. So why don't I give this thing a radius of uh, 5.0 meters? And we're going to assume, you know, as it says here, that uh, it's being ejected on the edge. So what you have here initially is a sphere that's rotating. Okay, so this is before. Um, we're going to do the same sort of thing that we've done in the past, and that is let it rotate about the z-axis. So it has an initial angular velocity of, uh, let's see here, 10 times a second. Or, um, you know, one revolution is 2 pi radians. So that's 20 pi radians per second. Okay. It has a mass. I'll call it m sub s. Of 500 kilograms and it's a sphere we're going to assume that it's a symmetric sphere um, it's not symmetric rather but um, it's a uniform solid sphere um, so that's two-fifths of r squared So this is before. Now, so what happens is, is this thing is going to eject, and we're going to make the same assumption basically is that this thing somehow maintains its spherical characteristics when it ejects it. Why are we going to make that assumption? Because we haven't been given any information other than, otherwise. The remaining object would be incredibly complicated if we don't know what it looks like. Um, still obviously going to be rotating in this direction. Maybe not, but we would assume it's going to be rotating this way. So, um, when this thing ejects it, if you were to, let's see, what's the best way to think about it? Actually, I'll tell you what, we're going to redraw this a little bit. And what I'm going to do is to now, now we're looking down on it. So um, it's rotating this way. This is omega. And when it ejects the material, we'll say it ejects it like this. So um, here's our chunk of material here. I'll call it M sub C for chunk. 25 kilograms. 
care. We're giving a velocity. Oh, I know exactly how it's going to be ejected. Okay. So um, the velocity here is going to be whatever the um, tangential velocity is of this thing as it leaves. So, so V here would be equal to R times omega naught. Okay. Because V tangential is R times omega. Um, and actually, let me get rid of the, uh, the directional information there. Uh, so, so here, um, if you think about the moment of inertia of this as it leaves, it's uh, r away, and it has a mass of m sub c. This is the moment of inertia of the chunk. Um, the angular velocity of the chunk when it leaves is going to be the same as the initial angular velocity. All right. Now, what's going to change here is going to be the angular velocity of the thing that's rotating because it's ejecting this material. So if I uh, use conservation of angular momentum here and look at what my initial angular momentum is, my initial angular momentum is just the whole satellite doing its thing, right? Which would be uh, two fifths mass of the satellite times the radius of the satellite times omega naught vector or two fifths m sub s r squared. Um, I'll just say omega naught z hat. Now, um, after it's ejected, you have the angular momentum of the satellite and you have the angular momentum of the chunk. Now, the satellite's mass has changed. It's lost this 25 kilograms here, okay? So what that means is, is that when you take a look at this right here, it's going to be two-fifths the mass of the satellite minus what it's lost. But the radius is still the same. It's rotating now at a new angular velocity, which is what we need to find. This right here is going to be m sub c r squared omega naught z hat because it's leaving at this initial velocity. So as it leaves, it kicks off on the satellite and slows it down. And these are equal. So what that means is, is two-fifths mass of the satellite r squared omega naught z hat is equal to two-fifths mass of the satellite minus mass of the chunk r squared omega, which is what we're trying to find plus m sub c r squared omega naught z hat. Now, the first thing I see is that the radius all cancels. So that's going to make things a little bit easier to deal with. Next, let's move this over here to this side and switch sides. All right. Um, as you can see, uh, on the right-hand side, some of this stuff will actually uh, pull together. You have an omega naught and Z hat on both. Okay. 
On the left hand side we have this two fifths m sub s minus m sub c. I'm going to move that over here. Oop, I'll do what we'll make it squared. We'll make a vector. All right, and now let's just plug stuff in. On the top, two-fifths, mass of the satellite is 500 kilograms minus the mass of the chunk, which was 25, yeah, 25 kilograms. It's rotating uh, 10 revolutions per second. Twenty pi radians per second in the z hat direction. Um, and here we have two fifths. Mass of satellite minus mass of the chunk. Five hundred minus twenty five is uh, four hundred seventy five kilograms. So if you do this, two fifths times five hundred minus twenty five times 20 times pi divided by two-fifths oops times 475 57.87 Um, radians per second in the z-hat direction. Now you compare that to uh, the original, which was 62. So 20 pi radians uh, per second is the same thing as about 62.8 radians per second. So as you can see, it's, it's lost speed as a consequence of ejecting it. All right. So, you know, so as I said, you know, um, this, this angular momentum stuff, um, it acts just like linear momentum, but it, it, it has some very far ranging applications. Now, one thing I will mention, I'm not going to cover the, 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 the section on um, tops and, and things that spin, um, but I did want to point out the fact that, you know, if you think, for example, of a spinning top, or anything that rotates, like a gyroscope. Well, I'm doing that one. I can do that. So anyway, if you think about something that rotates like a gyroscope, it has a mass, you know, uh, as a consequence, it's got a moment of inertia. It's rotating, so it has an angular velocity. That means that it has um, an angular momentum. And conservation means constant. It wants to hold this constant. So if this thing is rotating along this axis right here, we'll say, like this is the direction of rotation, we'll say, like that. So as this thing rotates, it wants to keep this direction of rotation and this value of L. Now, if you've ever played with a gyroscope before, or you've ever flipped a bicycle upside down, and like taking your hand and spun one of the wheels and then moved it, you'll notice that as you move it, it resists you. Now you, when you act on this thing, you're the external force. You're the external torque. Okay. You're providing an external torque. It's trying to hold everything in here constant. So when you try to move it, it fights you because it's trying to keep that physical principle in check. But since you are the external force, you can actually affect its motion, but you have to fight to do it. Now, another interesting observation is the fact that I itself depends upon the axis of rotation. 
So for example, if we were to go and look um, at our previous slide here, where is it at? Here. Okay. And let me uh, blow this up a little bit. We know that if you have, for example, um, the same object, this versus this versus this, whatever, the same object, different axes of rotation give you different moments of inertia. And moment of inertia acts like mass. So what that means is, is that if you were to look at a top or a gyroscope, there are some axes of rotation that have a large eye, which means they act like they have a large amount of mass, which means that they maintain that inertia very well as they rotate. And then there are some situations in which you have a small eye in which any sort of external torque that you put in will cause this thing to wobble. Okay. Now, uh, this is the reason why we use gyroscopes whenever we take and we, we're trying to balance things or maintain level. Like, for example, in a rocket, when it launches, there's a gyroscope that helps it keep track of level relative to the ground. And that gyroscope, as long as it's spinning, uh, will maintain that orientation. So that's it. That's, the, that's it for the chapter on angular momentum. Uh, next chapter, we're going to start talking about statics, which is pretty cool. So, and I'll see you then.